Lee Studies program has uh, introduced and invited many different types of guests uh, to our um, program and to the community. As you're looking up uh, at our um, upcoming events, in just a moment, I'm gonna go through them with you. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Farag Papazian. He's sitting back there. Dr. Papazian, would you stand up or just raise your hand there? Yeah. Dr. Papazian is our Kazan Muslim professor in Armenian studies for the fall semester. And he's joined by his wife, Nunet. Welcome to Fresno. They'll be here all semester. And he will be giving the second lecture in our series on Friday, September the 9th. And he's going to be talking about the uh, contemporary Turkey, that is the Armenians and other Armenians in contemporary Turkey today. And in particular, he's going to be giving three lectures. As you see, the second lecture will be on October the 7th. But the first lecture is going to be on the Christian Armenian community today in contemporary Turkey. That's going to be here uh, in this same hall in the, in the Smith Camp Alumni House. Some of you were asking me why are we having it here. The usual venue, which is the University Business Center, is being renovated, and they will not be ready for us uh, and any uh, guests until the middle of um, October, actually. Our next lecture, the second lecture, will be kind of the first uh, group back over there. We also have on September the 15th, I just want to introduce you also, that Dr. Rebecca Jinks will be here from London. And she's done an incredible work on the story of Armenian women survivors of the Armenian Genocide and how they were uh, adopted into Turkish and Kurdish families. And then later, after the armistice of 1918, were, were uh, rediscovered or re reunited with their families. And she's looking, actually, for stories from Fresno Armenians who may know of people who went through that experience with their grandmothers or great-grandmothers. So if any of you know that, uh, that would be great to come out. And then on September the 17th, we have a, a talk by uh, Dr. Bartan Matiosian and Artsy Bakhchinya. That's going to be a virtual lecture because we're spanning Armenia as well. So it'll be a 10 o'clock in the morning Zoom lecture here, but 9 o'clock in the evening in Armenia. Uh, and it's about the new book, which is called A Woman of the World, uh, Armin Ohanian, the dancer of Shamacha. Armin Ohanian is a really interesting figure I'll talk to you more about it at another time, but we've published a book on her life, and Dr. Matiosian and Dr. Bakchinyan have um, written the book and that we will be uh, introducing. So it's wonderful to see all of you here uh, this evening. Uh, tonight, our guest is Dr. Bedros de Matosian. He's coming to us from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, where he is the Vice Chair and Associate Professor of Modern and Middle Eastern History. And he is also the Hyman Rosenberg Professor in Judaic Studies at the Department of History at the University of Nebraska. He completed his doctorate in Middle East History at Columbia in 2008. He's also the president of the Society for Armenian Studies, which is the international body representing Armenian scholars and teachers throughout the world. And he is also the auditor, author, editor, and co-editor of multiple books, including his recent Shattered Dreams of Revolution, from Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire, which was published by Stanford University in 2014. Tonight, he's here to talk about his new book. And I'm gonna just switch the PowerPoint here very quickly. So that we go through that. And his new book is called The Horrors of Adana, Revolution and Violence in the Early 20th Century. It deals with the events that took place in April of 1909 uh, in the province of Adana, located in the southern Anatolia region of modern-day Turkey. Um, many of the Armenians know about the story, but if you're, you haven't been in the Armenian community, and I have some of my students, uh, he will be talking about the issue of the massacres of Adana, which claimed the lives of more than 20,000 Armenians and 2,000 Muslims, and one in which Dr. Dermatosian drew on primary sources in more than a dozen languages and has developed a very interesting approach uh, to the effects of how this massacre came to be. How do neighbors kill neighbors? What's the process by which violence uh, takes place? And he's explored that in his new book. The book will be on sale afterwards if anybody would like uh, to pick up a copy and Dr. Dermatosian will uh, be signing that as well. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight Thank you very much, Professor.
Professor Deirdre Hitchin for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is not my first time here. I come frequently here. And it's an honor to be here to present uh, my new book, uh, The Horrors of Adana, Revolution and Violence in the Early 20th Century. Most of most of most of the Armenians know about Adana. Some of them some of them don't know, most of them don't know about the details as to why the massacres happened. So First, the question would be, why did I write this book? First of all, the Adana massacres are not known in Middle Eastern studies as well as Ottoman studies. Second, there is little attention in Armenian history, history on the Adana massacres because the lion's share of history goes to the Armenian genocide because of its magnitude and the impact that the Armenian genocide had on Armenians and its repercussions to on Armenians was major, major catastrophic event. Third, I aim to write this book to, as a contribution to a new bourgeois field, which is called Massacre Studies. And we have genocide studies as a field, but there's a new field called Massacre Studies, in which uh, scholars study not genocide, but massacres. And there are, there are hundreds of massacres that took place in the course of history, but there are few genocides, if you think about it, have to have taken place in the modern period. Then I, I wanted to understand what happened through an interdisciplinary perspective. Because massacres or massacre as an event is such a complex phenomenon, it would not be possible to understand it only from the perspective of history. We need other perspectives, such as in the social scientific framework, such as sociology, anthropology, and psychology, specifically, to try to understand as to what happened during the period. Uh, from the beginning, I'd like to say that this book is not a definite, definitive history of the Adana massacres, because I don't believe in any definitive histories, because the Adana massacres has touched so many lives, so many villages. Each village itself could be the topic of a book. So history is very problematic as a field. And everyone who claims that this is the definitive history of the Adana genocide, it would be it would be doing injustice to the field. The other reason is I wanted to go beyond essentialization and the dichotomy of Muslims versus Armenians. You know, within the historiography and even the popular belief, Turks killed us, the Muslims killed us, the main factor was religion, uh, they were fanatics, we were victims, we were Christian victims. Uh, this might be the popular belief, but we as so we as social scientists or Historians, we have to problematize and support and try to understand the background and the, and the, and the structure of the violence that took place. And this is a sequel of, to my first book as part of the trilogy. In my first book, The Shattered Dreams of Revolution, I discussed the 1908 revolution that took place in 1908 by the Young Turks, uh, which brought uh, major hope to the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire with the trilogy of fraternity, liberty, and freedom. And the uh, Armenians thought that they were finally uh, free of the Hamidian shackles uh, and the despotism, and it was a new beginning. But I, as I showed in the book, from the first day of the revolution, Armenians became very pessimistic. Of course, revolutions are stars with euphoric feelings. Everyone is happy about the revolution. But the degree litmus test of any political system starts when the euphoric feelings fade. And this is true to in every revolution, even with the Arab Springs, even with the Arab Spring, you remember how much how every all the Arab countries were really in which revolution had taken place were really happy about the event itself. In the book, I discuss, I analyze the book from the perspective of four interrelated themes, and these are from social science. Perspective. The first one is public and subaltern public spheres. I don't want to go into theoretical details here, but I argue in my book that public spheres have opened the way in which ethnic violence escalated or intensified in the case of the Ottoman Empire. Public spheres contributed to the violence because until 1908, public spheres were repressed because we were dealing with the despotic regime of Abdel Hamid II. When freedom starts after the 1908 revolution, everyone is happy. The public sphere is open. 
Armenians express their desire openly, but it could act as it is entitled. If we think that the public sphere that was open after the making of revolution contributed to Armenian activism, it also, the public sphere was used by the discontented elements of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. mainly belonging to the Armenian regime, to use the public sphere to try to get back at the new regime, which would be the other Second, the whole idea of rumors. Never underestimate, never underestimate the role of rumors in the escalation or in the intensification of violence. Rumors are defined as unverified accounts of an event. They are usually happen during crisis. I mean, even within this country, uh, think of the way in which rumors really contributed to the intensification of uh, political intentions. The riots, uh, January riots. The rumors in every massacre, actually, every massacre, a massacre played a dominant role in the in the, in the escalation of uh, of tensions. And the rumors in the case of Adana played a dominant role also. It solidified ethnic boundaries. It created us versus them, and it led to the uh, enactment of violence against the vulnerable Armenian community. The third concept that I discuss in the book are emotions. Emotions as a category is not studied in the course of history, specifically in the case of the Indian Ottoman Empire. Because how do you study emotions? You know, you never go up into the, the people 200 years uh, prior to the events or 200 years ago. Emotions are a complex category because massacres carry with them specifically from the perspective of the perpetrator a lot of emotional baggage. Emotions are heightened during the, during the crisis and they contribute to the enactment of violence and these emotions are based on preconceived notions about the other, about the enemy, and for the Muslim Turks who were living in the region, they all had a sinister, they all had a perception of the Armenians, as the Armenians are having sinister aims to uh, to uh, to uh, achieve independence. Sinister aims also in economic field. There was economic envy towards the success of Armenians and other. Last but not least is the humanitarianism and humanitarian intervention. Of course, this is endemic to the three phases of violence uh, suffered by the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, the Hamidian Empire, the Hamidian massacres, the Adana massacres, and the, uh, and the Armenian genocide. Humanitarian intervention is a category which was used in the 19th century, which meant that wherever European powers saw that in the case of the Ottoman Empire or the Middle East, that a group is being massacred, they would intervene to stop the massacres or to stop the repetition of that massacres. But with all the hopes of the Armenians that the Europeans are going to come and help us, nothing happened in the three cases. There were humanitarianism, humanitarian aid, but there was no humanitarian intervention. Again, humanitarian intervention entails the uh, physical intervention by sending military troops in the country, in the targeted country, to stop the massacres or to stop the repetition, prevent the repetition of the massacres. Now, why the Europeans did not intervene in other? It's the same question as to why they did not intervene during the Hamidian massacres. Why didn't they not intervene in the Armenian genocide? As scholars of humanitarian intervention says, uh, scholar uh, Ramit Yeradokno, that the Europeans would intervene only if they agree all together that no one is going to benefit from the intervention. So you see intervention by Europeans in the case of Lebanon, 1861, in the case of Crete, in the case of Greece. But the Armenian case represents the classic case of non-intervention. Why? Because the British had an interest, the French had another interest, the Russians had other interests, so Armenians became a victim of that political machinery that existed in the world. Yeah. 
So this is a map of Adana. And of course, Adana occupies an important portion of the region of Cilicia. And it's important to understand the Cilician history, the past, in order to understand the mentality and emotions of the Muslim perpetrators in enactment of violence. Because prior to the with the, with, the, with the beginning of the revolutionary movement in the Ottoman Empire, the, specifically in the case of Adana during the Hamidian period, rumors started spreading around that Armenians are going to revolt in order to establish the kingdom of Cilicia. And what was the kingdom of Cilicia? This is the kingdom of Cilicia. Some scholars say 1197. Some say 1198. Sergei is here. Uh, Ani. Ani has an article that she says uh, 1198, not 1997. Regardless of that, that's not, that's not the topic today. But Armenian kingdom is the last independent kingdom that existed, the last independent entity that existed in that section prior to the First Republic, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Cis was an important center, spiritual center, until the end of the Ottoman Empire. It was uh, the, uh, the place that the Armenian Catholic Society used to exist, then transferred to Antilles, of course. And again, all this important section is part of Adana. Adana is here, Tarsus mm -hmm. is here, uh, Merci is where Merci should be here. And if you think about these, this section is extremely important to understand how history and the past and Armenians, Armenian yearning of the past, celebrating of the Cilician past, played an important role in the enactment in, in of violence. I argue in the book that there are both long term causes and short term causes for the violence. Of course, in every violence, in every violence that takes place in the, in the course of history, there are always triggers. Regardless of the fact that these causes exist or not, there are triggers that lead to the violence. Here are the few, here are the few long-term causes that led to the uh, enactment of violence. First of all, administrative reforms in the Ottoman Empire, which played an important role in deconstructing the boundaries of the, uh, of the uh, uh, province of Adana. Second is the centralization and pacification of tribes. This was during the Tanzimat period, which aimed at settling these tribes in places which were inhabited by Armenians, hence creating what historians call niche overlap, uh, competition over these resources. Then we have influx of refugees resulting over competition over resources. These refugees, most of them came from the Caucasus, Muslim refugees, others came from the Balkans. And from the Ottoman perspective, the policy was to uh, inhabit them in, uh, in areas of Armenians with, thus creating tensions between the Armenians and the Muslims, mm -hmm. but also it was part of the larger policy of demographic engineering. Third, changes in the land codes. This was specifically with the 1857 land code, in which now the aim was to get direct taxation from the farmers, but eventually it was counterproductive. I don't want to get into details, but Armenians ended up buying large tracts of land, and towards the end of the 19th century, Armenians became major landowners in the region. Last but not least, I argue the most important for me is the economic development. Why the region of Cilicia is economically important? Because of the cotton, cotton production. Think of cotton and blood. Cotton is white, soap and blood is bloody. And cotton plays an important role in the massacres, if you think about connecting both together. Cotton was called as the occulton, as the white gold, because it was so precious. In the global economic system, Cotton becomes very important commodity after the American Civil War of 1861, when the cotton production declines in the South, 
the global market starts looking at other places. You have India, you have Egypt, and you have South America. To a certain extent, this is there. So there's major, major intervention in Lebanon, the European market, major development of the of the of the means of production, but also production of machinery, producing or pro, uh, producing uh, uh, you know tilling machinery, steam machines. That accelerated the development of production of cotton. <coughs> Adana as a region was also the place where annually, twice actually, around 100 to 120,000 migrant workers would come from the other provinces. They would come during two seasons, tilling and harvesting. For cotton tilling, which was in the spring, in April, Adana massacres took place in April, the two phases, April 14 to 16, and the second phase is April 25 to 27. Around 30 or 40,000 of these migrant workers were Armenians. They would come annually, twice, and Muslims, of course, from the surrounding provinces. They would work there and go back to their provinces, thus helping their own families, their migrant workers. And as the economic development started uh, advancing in Adana, and there was less use now to the handwork, to the migrant workers, there started a major resentment by the Muslims against the Armenians. Because Armenians played a dominant role in the introduction of modern implements of production. The short term causes are the young Turk revolution of 1908. Of course, the Young Turk Revolution is an important event not only for the Ottomans but also for the history of the Middle East. It was a revolution uh, that needs to be understood in the larger global phase of revolutions that took place at, this, at the time Iran, 1905, 1911, Mexico, 1911. And the Young Turks were actually, most of them were atheists. They were uh, infused by European ideologies of, sort of scientific. Uh, of, uh, of sciences, uh, of uh, liberty, of constitutionalism, but also uh, uh, of biological materialism. And to that extent, they were interested in social engineering. When they come into power, at the first week, you start seeing the euphoric feelings among the young church and others, but it eventually proves that their, their, their idea of constitutionalism and parliamentarism was only used as a means for an aim. The aim would be controlling the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire and making sure that the Committee of Human Progress, the Ittihadis, would remain in power. This is one. But also, the Young Turk Revolution created a major uh, major earthquake within the Ottoman Empire. It led to the emergence of major dissatisfied elements within the Ottoman Empire who was benefiting from the Hamidun regime. Imagine you come, you, you uh, initiate a revolution and remove everyone from their positions and bring your own party people up with them. And you know, one, I remember reading one report what the Armenian intellectual who says, the problem with the Young Turk Revolution that it was a bloodless revolution. The French Revolution played an important role in the Young Turk Revolution as a motto, with the whole, you know, using the whole liberté, equality, fraternité, the, the addition that the uh, Young Turks brought was the, the concept of justice too. But to that extent, I think uh, the problem is that none of them really problematized the, uh, the French Revolution. We tend to think about the French Revolution as this, uh, this. Uh, this fascinating event, but it was a bloody revolution, it was a very problematic revolution. Mm -hmm. Then the second short term event was the emergence of a resilient public sphere. In this public sphere, suddenly you have multiple groups now playing together at the same time, politically playing at the same time. You have now the emergence of clandestine movements such as the Dashnaks, the Munchaks, and other Armenian groups who now use the liberty in order to express their feelings, their uh, yearning to the past, uh, they put together theatrical presentations. One of these theatrical presentations 
was used multiple times as justification for the Armenian, uh, Armenian sinister aims to establish the Kingdom of Cilicia was called Timurlein and Sivas. Now, for a long time, I, I, uh, I, I had the actual the, the dialogue that took place that was covered by one of the Nocturne newspapers, but the dialogue, but I never knew where was the, who wrote this and where was it taken from. Many years ago, I was doing research at the National Association for Armenian uh, Studies. I was looking into just skimming books. Finally, I came across Bedrostoria, and I found that this was taken from Bedrostoria in the theatrical presentation. Mm -hmm. And Bedrostoria died many years ago before the other manifesto. And then I also, but I compared them. It didn't, there were certain similarities, but there were differences too. But then, upon stumbling on the diaries of Bushev, Bishop Seropian, which I'm going to discuss now, the prelate of Adana, he mentioned in his unpublished memoirs that we changed the, the, uh, the, present, the theatrical presentation so it, it does not touch the sensitivities of the Muslims. Because in all these presentations, theatrical presentation, Muslim dignitaries were invited, but after the, after the theatrical, theatrical presentation, our means stood up and shouted, Armenia, don't live Armenia, don't live Armenia. So again, I am not blaming Armenians here, but to a certain extent, the, uh, the, the problem with the Young Turk Revolution is that it wasn't gradual. You were under the Spotted Regime, and suddenly everything's free. And so people started using and abusing the freedom, and I discussed that in my first book. The third event was the Counter-Revolution of April 13, 1909, which took place uh, after nine months of the revolution, it was uh, it was uh, a, a kind of a, a blow to the CUP. It was initiated by the conservative elements in the Ottoman Empire, but also liberals participated in the counter-revolution to try to get rid of the CUP. So when the news of the counter-revolution arrives in Adana, then people get Encouraged that this is an event that's taking place and our needs to come to the event. This is these are the farmers on the plains of Adana. These are actual images. Uh, cotton. Uh, you know, there were many, there were different types of cottons. There was American cotton, there was Egyptian cotton, you know, different brands of cotton. This is the American cotton. Uh, family spinning cotton in Adana. So the families stored cotton in their basement. If you think about Adana. If you see images of Adana, it looks like uh, World War II Paris. Everything is destroyed. Let me discuss here quickly the important figures because agency is important here. You know, these massacres took place during a time in which it wasn't the kind of disorganized. There were always leaders which fomented, played an important role in using the masses, directing them against the uh, against the army. So Bishop Musha Seropian, a very powerful and important figure, who was the prelate of Adana, uh, under the radar of the uh, Ottoman intelligence secret service, because he used to be a Hanchak member, Hanchak activist, and revolutionary too. But then he had a problem with them, and he left them, and eventually came uh, to become the prelate of Adana. Very powerful figure, I would say. The most powerful figure, more powerful than Sahak, the Catholic was Sahak II. Uh, but Adana was spared during the Hamidi massacres due to the fact that the governor of Adana and, and Bishop Mushaf, Bahri Pasha, the governor of Adana, were in were very good terms. They cooperated with each other. And that's why, if you think about the young church, they also kicked out the good people. So they were good people during the Hamidi regime. Case in mind is Bahri Pasha, the governor. So Bishop Musha Seropia, in the whole paranoia or the prophecy that was created as part of the rumors, was going to initiate the revolution and appoint himself as the king of Sinisha. That was it. Why? Because after the revolution, they saw him as wearing these vests of as a king. These weren't the vests, these were the liturgical vests. And there was a tapor maybe or something, and they saw him, okay, he's the king. He's meaningful, you know. He was, to a certain extent, provocative. 
he, he went around and told people, buy weapons, buy weapons. And Armenians were buying weapons. In the post-revolution period, Armenians were buying weapons, as well as the Muslims were buying weapons. Mm -hmm. And I even did research in the Russian archives in trying to look what is the aim of buying weapons. And I found one word, Ikna Bashmanitun, self-defense. And the self-defense is extremely important here because they were afraid that the Hamidian regime is going to back and retain back their status and eventually armies are going to be conflict. The second figure here is Garbet with Gerilla, a major player in the political scene in Adana. He was a lawyer, major landowner, and he was also part of the prophecy that Dr. Elia is going to attack the Muslims, kill them. Even you see uh, telegrams being sent from the province to province that Dr. Elia is coming on horses with 500 Armenian fighters, etc. I mean, it's very difficult to find these images, by the way. You know, I came by the way by luck through them. You know. Now, Dr. Elia had a serious problem with this, well, okay, with this guy, Abdel Qadir Bardani Zadi, one of the most important figures in Adana, a notable, who was the largest landowner, but also complicit in the massacres, and played a dominant role in fomenting, in directing the masses in the massacres. And this image of him, I found it uh, late, about a few months ago, actually. So some of these figures, you can't find their image. This is the Bahri Pasha market, the Bahri Pasha Tarshisil, which was built by Bahri Pasha in coordination with Bishop Musha Salopin. All these shops were owned by Armenians. This is kind of the opening ceremony in Adana. Of course, the Young Turk Revolution brings a lot of hope, and this is the event of celebrating the Young Turk Revolution. They establish here the Ark, the Ark of Victory, and everyone here they're doing, they're uh, taking uh, promise uh, for, uh, to, uh, to defend the constitution with their own blood and their enemies. Now, during, the, during this period, we have an important political event happening after the revolution. Unlike the other provinces, in the province of Adana, we have the emergence of now a new body, new governor, by the name of Javad Bey. And Javad, Javad Bey is a very conservative person cooperating with Abdul Hamid. And then you have the young Turks establishing themselves in Adana. And their leader is this guy, Ehsan Fikri, who would play an important role in disseminating now written rumors about the prophecy. And this is his colleague, Ismail Safar as well, also an important young Turk. Figure. Now, the first massacres, the first wave of massacres take place between April 14 and April 16. But there is a there are there is one specific event that triggers all of this. One day, around April 9 or 10, an Armenian by the name of Ohanes is attacked by three Muslims. For his self-defense or something, he kills one of the Muslims. And the, the funeral of that Muslims become a major emotional event for mobilization of masses against the Armenians. Because for them, the Armenians now, like Armenian who killed the Muslim becomes the Armenians who killed the Muslims. And the guy escapes to Cyprus apparently with the aid of Garabit Bertelli, the same figure that instructs fear in India. And eventually, the news of the country revolution comes and it triggers the first event. Armenians open their shops in the morning, but rumors spread that Armenians are going to attack the Muslims. Armenians are afraid, they close their shops, go to their home, and Muslim says, Muslim population say now that Armenians are preparing to attack us. And then you have now the beginning of the first wave massacres. Uh, around 2,000 Armenians are killed and 400 uh, Muslims were killed. Of course, uh, the Armenians are. Uh, the Armenians did kill Muslims, but it was in self-defense. Uh, the attack is on the Armenian quarter, and the first round of massacres ends. The interwar, inter-massacre period is extremely important. It is from April 16 to April 20, 25th, nothing, nothing happened. 
that they are important to the book of the Bible. A Saint Fikri, who is the editor of the Nature newspaper called the Kudadi, which means moderation, he publishes in April 20, in number 33, the following article, followed by multiple articles. It says a surprising report. In it, he lays out in a written form the rumors that were spreading around that Armenians now failed, initiated a failed insurrection, a failed attempt to establish the kingdom of Cilicia. Now, rumors are rumors, you know, they pass by very fast from one person to another. But when you write a rumor, when you print a rumor, it becomes more dramatic. But people start believing what was happening. So this contributed also to the dissemination of misinformation about the massacres. So these are some images of the city of Adana, ruins. As you see, it's mainly destroyed city because it was burned. Adana was burned. Armenians, you know, and of course, we tend to think that the Adana massacre took place in the city of Adana, that was the beginning. And then the rumors spread around different towns and cities, and the rumors were what? That Armenians are killing Muslims in the city of Adana, and their, you know, rumors, emotions, they brought into a here, and intensifying the boundaries, attacking Armenians, so attacking Armenians takes place in all parts. Hello? Yes. There were thousands of refugees after the massacres, and they were housed under tents, and the, of course the Europeans did not initiate any humanitarian intervention, despite the fact that their cruisers were docking in the uh, in, in Mercy, in the port city of Mercy, no one dared to do anything. Now, within this period, after writing these articles, Armenians hear the news that additional battalions are coming from the west part of the Ottoman Empire, from Romania, to bring law and order, and they're related. And on April 25th, April 25th, these battalions arrived in the city of Rome. And now the second wave of massacre started, which was more brutal than the first one, because most Armenians who escaped from the surrounding villages came to other some of them were housed in the Armenian school, the Musherian school. The whole the school was burned down, including the Armenian school. And there are multiple explanations as to why the massacres took place. Some argue that Armenians shot on the camp where the Armenian or the Ottoman soldiers were triggering a wave of massacres. Others say that Armenians attacked them in different parts of the neighborhood. Some say that the Kurds attacked the Ottomans in order to instigate the second wave. Of course, this is the first time now that the Ottoman government in this year of Nocturnes sent two investigation commissions in order to understand why the massacre took place. One of them was the government commission, Faik Bey and Harujun Osijan, and the second one was the parliamentary commission, Abu Babidia and Musakema. I'm going to discuss here the importance of Babidia's report. This is Member of Parliament, Hago Babidia, who is a very important lawyer. He was a member of the CUP, Committee of Union Progress, and he was sent to Adana with preconceived notions that maybe the Armenians are the really, really, really you know, initiated the revolution. He comes to Adana, goes to different areas, investigates the situation, and comes back criticizing the local court martial. I'm going to discuss the local court martial. He writes a long report of 80 pages in Ottoman, of which we don't have a copy. Three days prior to his testimony, the, the testimony in the parliament, he dies. I have read the interview of his daughter, which was done in Paris, by her daughter and granddaughter, Cindy Marianne, actually, is his granddaughter. And she says that, she says that one day, I remember 
two Ottoman soldiers, two Ottoman CUP members came to the house and gave a cigarette to my father, Babikian. And then after that, he died in mysterious circumstances. Now, we don't know whether this is true or not. It could be true, it could not be true. But then, what's the coincidence that three days prior to presenting his report, he dies? Of course, there is, a, there is another story that Armenians come and take lithograph and copy the report. And the, because the, the lengthy copy that we have, this was in Armenian, was only published in 1919, not 1909. So Babikian is an important figure that we need to study and understand what happened to Babikian. What did his report say? Because in 1919, it says that the young Turks were involved. In my analysis of the book, I say yes, this call, the local CP was involved, the local young Turks, but we don't have the proof that the central CP was involved in the massacres. There are two counter, counter counterfactual or counter arguments to this that argue that, well, we have two proofs that the young Turks were involved. One of them is the massacres that they, the second battalion, second wave of massacres that was carried out by the young Turk battalion that was sent. The other one is a telegram that was sent with from the dog from the from the center, Istanbul, to the Adalan governor, when the a governor says, tells them tells them that the situation is out of control here, please advise us what to do. And the undersecretary of the government sends a telegram saying, make sure to take care of all the international or foreign uh, uh, establishment and consulates. So I mean read this as a euphemistic way. Protect the, protect the foreigners, but kill the Christians. Armenians, sorry. Of course, there were few courts marshals that were established. First of all, when the massacres end, immediately hundreds of Armenians are imprisoned with the false accusations that they initiated an uprising to establish the Kingdom of Cilicia. And the local marshal, local court marshal, half of them were made up of the perpetrators. Forceful testimony was taken from Armenians under torture. And eventually, with Armenian complaints, a second now court martial is sent under the presidency of Kenan Basha. Now, Kenan Basha comes to Adana, establishes a military tribunal, court martial. And instead of starting, starting investigations afresh, he takes whatever was done by, by the local court, which was biased and totally, you know, totally uh, uh, misrepresented the situation, and he cannot much accuses the Armenians as being the reason of the uh, massacres. Of course, they don't call it massacres, they call it disturbances or events. Then, at the, at the same time here, when Kanan Pashka is here, Babikian is in Adana. He sees how the performance of the court martial is taking place. He starts complaining. He says that there are people, Armenians, six Armenians, by the way, were hanged, and around 35 Muslims were hanged. He says one of the Armenians who was hanged wasn't even at the event. He was hiding in, the, in, in one of the foreign banks. And this court martial, he says, Kenan Pasha is very questionable. And immediately, this starts the major snowball effect. And uh, Kenan Pasha now resigns as the president, accuses of accuses of Babikian for fomenting the situation. And now, with the complaints of the Armenian deputies, the Armenian patriarchy resigns, of course. Eventually, this last court martial is sent by Ismail Pasha. During this period, the Kenan Pasha's period, the Armenians say that, you're kidding me. You're just bringing some uh, uh, poor peasants and handing them. And you're leaving the real culprits of the massacres free. Who are the real culprits, regardless of their involvement or not? 
but they're responsible for it. The governor, Jabate, who wasn't able to control the situation, wasn't punished. The Abdel Qadir Bardadizad, the most of them, his acolytes, exactly the, the, the editor of the newspaper, Mustafa Renzi Pasha, the commander of Adana, all of these either failed to, to uh, implement their duties or were implicitly were implicit in the massacres. What are the types of the murderers that took place? Of course, there is a long list in Ottoman of all the crimes that were perpetrated. Uh, if, you, if you read the list, we have 450 people who convicted, some 400 people convicted. Uh, 380 of them were Muslims and 20 of them were Armenians. Type of uh, murders, uh, most of the murders were, uh, most of the people were murdered by bullets, hence indicating the supremacy of, uh, of the weaponry. Second, by extortion, Culture using wrong instruments, and finally, rape was another type of murder. And the and these court martials used, used the Ottoman Penal Code in order to try the convicts. So they followed to a certain extent the law, but the whole process was a sham. If you think about it, and arson is important, important, important. Uh, now, the last section of this presentation deals with justice. Was there really a justice in these court martials? Of course, they, they did use the Imperial Ottoman Penal Code, just a family and family and family and family. So, a total of 34, 347 people were convicted, and the types of sentences are this 15 days in prison, temporary exile, imprisonment, ranging from 15 days to life. Total banishment from the Ottoman Empire or banishment to different parts and death sentences. Six Armenians were hanged and about 35 other Muslims were hanged. Now, in my book, I raise the question Who do you really convict? When someone is putting the gun, do you convict the bullets within the gun or the person who is trying to the gun? It was the last court martial that convicted the real perpetrators by providing them very light sentences, ranging from 15 days in prison to banishment. No one really got, got hard, uh, hard uh, sentences. These are Armenians on the gallows. The most prominent of them was Kassab Misar, Misar the uh, Again, if you ask me, Armenians were on the defensive position here. Of course, Armenians were not victim only. You know, they did kill also. But, you know, the, uh, the situation was what it was. Then I tried to put the Adana massacres to the end of the book in the global perspectives. I tried to raise a question as to how neighbors living by the side of each other, you know, as neighbors, suddenly become violent perpetrators of crime. I tried to raise the, the question that violence and massacres are not endemic to specific society. They're, they're not, they do not have biological traits that belong to one culture or society. Violence and massacres in the global history have taken place in different parts of the world. It's not only about Islam here. You know, there were major massacres perpetrated by Christians, Protestants against the Catholics, and so on. Massacres are regarded far more complex phenomenon than that appears. In the book, I compared other massacres to those of the Odessa massacre of 1905, in which the Jews were massacred in the city of Odessa. Today, it's Ukraine. You know. And then I argue that I discuss also the Sikh massacres that took place in 1984. Of course, tensions existed at, at the time. But it was the assassination of Indira Gandhi, if you remember, by her two Sikh bodyguards, which really became the trigger of the massacres. Mm -hmm. I argue that structures of violence and actors are similar in different cases of massacre. You have structural violence, you have major players, and you have the masses. 
that these masses are manipulated by the, what I call the group agent provocateurs, agent competitors. Police, police are involved in both cases, and in all these cases, justice has never achieved. In all cases of massacre, you don't have justice. I mean, is there really full justice? Even the Holocaust, you don't have justice. But 30 people will try. All the Nazis escaped to Latin America, Argentina, the fake passport, and the complicity of the Catholic Church and the Pope is really, you know, uh, this element today. So, even in the case of the Sikh massacre, for example, until today, there is no justice. <coughs> there has been 10 commissions in India to investigate as to what happened during the Sikh riots. They call it riots. This is very important work because defining the event itself is the powerful entity that defines the event. Yeah. The government never says that massacres took place. Disturbances or riots, because it has the power to do so, where it was massacred. And, you know, is there really justice? I argue that in the case of the modern massacres, there were no more justice. It was no more justice, but there was no justice because the real culprits were not really, they did not receive what they deserved. On the contrary, some of the poor peasants that were, that paid the price, and these are motivated by not religion, religion could be one of them, but motivated with easy access to wealth. Because looting was also an important factor, not only in the Armenian genocide, but in the other massacres. How we can get fast to looting and get, you know, get with easy access. And when you kill, you go to the house, loot whatever you can, and it's yours. And that was that's what happened in the case of Adana. It wasn't only Adana, the massacres, it's a way. It pulled to the province of Aleppo. Even in Aleppo, cities were uh, were damaged, but the uh, but the governor of Aleppo was able to handle the situation much better than the governor of uh, Adana. And here I'm going to stop to take questions. Thank you very much. Professor Laporta. Thanks, Ben. As you said, like, uh, the masters at Adana are often overlooked or overshadowed by the genocide. And I was just wondering if you could, one of the things that comes up is the, the masters as a foreshadowing of the genocide, yeah. right? In that here we see almost a test run of how the genocide could be per perpetrated, even if the same exact people weren't involved. And I'm just wondering if there's any sort of reflection later on by the CUP um, on what happened at Adana as a blueprint for what would later happen. Um, of course, so I mean, in the book I discuss these approaches too, which is the approach of continuum. I don't believe in the continuum approach that Adana was a dress rehearsal for the Armenian genocide. I argue that these are separate events, but one thing, one thing, two things are common. First of all, impunity in all cases, Armenian cases impunity, the Armenian genocide impunity, but also what Adana shows us that the level of ethnic, ethnic, ethno religious tensions in the region is so high that even a minor trigger, minor event could really trigger the spiral violence of massacre. In the case of in the case of World War One, in the case of Adana, it was a counter revolution, one fighting. But in the case of 1914, 1915, it was a World War One, where affected disposition, the emotions are high, and you know it's either them or us, so we're going to kill them. You know. Paranoia played an important role, hatred an important role, accumulated envy an important role, and it was, I mean, there is no way to explain what happened. Even today we try to understand what happened. But it was clear that the CUP, the leadership, manipulated the masses in order to finally find a solution to the Armenian question and get rid once and for all with the Armenians. That was through so the demographic engineer. They believe in biological materialism, materialism in scientific ways. So they even manipulated religion in order to, I mean, they declared jihad. Who was behind the idea of jihad? The Germans. Why? Because they can incite the Muslims in India to rise against the uh, British Raj, uh, 
uh, they can incite the uh, North Africans to rise against the uh, French and uh, etc. So think about that. I mean, uh, I argue that religion was an important component, but unlike other scholars, uh, religion was not the main factor. 